Hello, my migratory peeps! This is Ket, aka Kakibot, and today I am bringing you a very practical video. One could argue the most practical video for many of you, because if you follow my channel and if you click through into this video, chances are you are interested in knowing what are the pathways you can take to move from wherever you are now to the UK. Slash Scotland specifically, because a lot of you love that. Not just UK. Scotland is the best. Yes, so that's what we're going to be covering today. We're going to be kind of giving you an overview of uh, what options you have and uh, what are the no-nos of moving here and how long you can stay and what to prepare for. Um, I'm going to start by giving you two disclaimers, first of which being when I first moved here, that was 11 years ago and we were still in the EU and it was very easy for me to just like walk up to the immigration officer and be like, here's a passport. Actually, I didn't even have to have a passport. I was like, here's my ID from a country that you probably never even heard of before. I'm not planning to leave ever. And they were like, we can't stop you. Welcome. <laughs> Indefinitely. Um, and yeah. I think that a lot of you know that in the past couple of years the situation has changed dramatically, especially for people from mainland Europe. Um, right now things are much harder and so a lot of this video is not at all based on my own personal experience. However, I did work quite closely with a bunch of people who are here on all sorts of visas and I also um, collaborated with my assistant Diane uh, who did a deep deep dive into all of those governmental sites and try to put together all this helpful information that we then try to boil down into something digestible. Okay, the second disclaimer is uh, if you clicked through into this video because you wanted to say something unsavory about immigration in general or you want to say something about dinghies, uh, just don't. Um, Please keep in mind that whenever you leave a horrible, trolly, unhappy comment, something about, ah, don't make this about politics, um, by ironically making it all about politics in that comment, um, <laughs> you are helping the algorithm to take this video and show it to all of those people who wants to move here. So, I mean, if you're really invested into not having people move to the UK, just, just don't comment at all. Okay, so I thought I would start by listing three things that I thought were the most important takeaways from all of these weeks that we spent working on this theme. First of which is that um, money truly does fix everything in the case of trying to move here, because uh, some of the visas uh, we are going to cover later really only kind of stand on, like, if you have an all right amount of money, you can make things happen. And also a lot of people told me that uh, if you're expecting to invest a certain amount of money into the immigration process and moving, expect it to be actually a lot more than you thought. It's, yeah, it is very expensive and everyone, every single person I talked to said that money is like the most important part of it. Another thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, nowadays the immigration process and the rules are quite similar to pretty much everyone, anyone from anywhere in the world. Um, two things, I think that if you're from the Commonwealth, you will get more options. I think that's the biggest part of it. It's not that it's easier per se, it's that you have a lot more of those pathways and it's just uh, more likely that you're connected to the UK historically and that does help. Also, you do have to keep in mind that the immigration officers, um, they do not work with like, I mean, obviously they do work with some, some very specific rules, but they are also given a certain amount of like discretion at which they can choose who to let in here and who they do not want to let in here. So be nice to your immigration officer, whoever you talk to, keep that in mind that like, this is a real human uh, who hopefully doesn't have any sort of prejudice against your specific nationality. Um, and yeah, make life easier for them by doing your paperwork right and it might help you greatly. And third thing, and this is something that applies to how things are specifically right now, um, as you can imagine, the world politics are, you know, there's a bit of a turmoil going on, so... Um, yeah, there's a lot that the immigration offices and officers have to process right now. So the process is actually quite a lot longer than it would normally be. So 
yeah, keep that in mind. If you're doing your research and you're looking at some numbers and like time expectations that were written like a year ago, you will probably have to add a couple of weeks to those. Okay, so now let's start by listing some of the options that I think are kind of accessible, although I think that they might not be for everyone and they might not be fully what you want from moving here. Obviously, the first is the standard visitor visa. For many of you, this is something that you can do in that sort of like classic way of just coming here with a passport. I believe that at this point there is not really much that you have to do if you're coming from like North America or the EU. Um, I think that this is going to be changing pretty soon. I think there are some fees being introduced kind of similarly to when you travel from the UK or EU to the US and you have to pay like 16 pounds to get your, your ESTA, which is like the visa waiver thing. Um, but right now, basically, like you don't have to worry about that too much. It's not really about like getting approved for it. You can come over and stay for six months, which I didn't know that. I didn't know that you can stay for six months. Because if Simon right now wanted to go to Prague, he would only be allowed to stay for three months. Or if I wanted to go to Japan or the United States, I would also only be allowed to be there for three months. So those six months are actually quite generous. And that kind of kept me thinking, like if you want to move to the UK, like this is something that you should probably take advantage of like if everything else is very expensive and very time consuming or like you just feel like there's no way you're gonna you know get a hold of the actual like five-year visa six months like okay you're not gonna be like settled down but i feel like it's enough to later on in your life say like i lived in the uk I mean, okay, like I can't say that in six months I've like learned all the ins and outs of uh, life in the UK, but I think it's a pretty generous amount of time. Now, another pretty cool thing is the youth mobility visa, which basically covers all of the Commonwealth countries. Um, let me just, I'm just gonna double check with my computer here. Mm. Yes, so it's Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and then also for some reason, Monaco, San Marino and Iceland. So it's kind of these like tiny rich countries as well. Um, so within these countries, if you're a national of one of these six countries, essentially between 18 and 30 years of age, you can be a part of this mobility visa and come here for, I believe, up to two years. And you get to study or work and you can pretty much do anything. Um, there are also four other countries that are included in this, but the system works a bit differently. That is Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea and Taiwan. And if you're from those, you will have to enter a ballot. So basically you will have to be I'm just imagine like I, I'm just imagining like your name being drawn out of some sort of like magician hat. Uh, probably not the process that's in place, but yeah, I mean it's still pretty good. Although I would say that if you're planning to travel with let's say your partner or your sibling, then it kind of implies a chance of like only one of you being given the chance to partake in the scheme, and that seems a bit problematic. Um, yeah, anyway, um, interestingly, for Kiwis specifically, this scheme is gonna be extending uh, from the 18 to 30 to 18 to 35. So, you know, like, <laughs> if, if I was a Kiwi, I would still be able to come here at my um, higher level age in 2024, yes. And even more interestingly, if you're watching this and you're from the UK already, if you're a British citizen, why? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why you're watching this, but if you are, then in 2024, you will actually get a chance, if you're under 35, to go and get the same visa in New Zealand. So you will be able to go work and live and enjoy New Zealand legally uh, on this extended youth mobility program, which I think is cool. The government was also about to roll out a similar program for Indian citizens, but I think it's not in place yet. I think that the whole, you know, world situation kind of stopped that in its tracks before it went out, but I think that's supposed to be coming out soon. So if you're from India, keep an eye on that. Also, I think that the youth mobility scheme is one of the more affordable ones because you basically need about 250 pounds to apply and then you need to have about 2500 in your savings um i'm just gonna 
pause here for a bit to say that whenever I mention any like necessary savings for your visa application, keep in mind that the money has to be and has to like have been in your savings account for an extended amount of time. If you're just moving the money in and out, if you, for example, thought like, oh no, like now the government's going to be checking on my bank account, I need to quickly borrow some money from my parents and they transfer that money in, that's going to look really dodgy and that might lead to your application uh, being rejected. So you don't want to do that. So yeah, keep that in mind. Whenever I talk about savings, this means savings that are like sitting there. Um, I think that for certain nationalities, there's a little like a caveat where it doesn't have to be um, like a regular savings account, but it can be like an ISA or something similar. I think that uh, particularly f my Canadian friend mentioned that that was an option for them. Anywho, okay, so let's move on to the more grown up visas. So as I was processing all of this information and uh, there was a lot of it and it was complicated, I basically settled on deciding that the best visa to go for is the student visa followed by the graduate visa. And what I really like about it is that when you're on this particular route, um, you do feel like UK kind of like wants you here. Um, essentially to simplify things, when you get your student visa, then you spend three or four years either on your undergrad studies or one year on your postgrad or a couple years on your like PhD studies. And after that, you can apply for the graduate visa, which is usually, um, I think that it's two years for like the regular courses, the undergrad and postgrad, and three years if you had your PhD finished here and essentially during your time on the graduate visa you can do anything like it's the best time to like start a career sort of start a family you can like it really feels like at that point UK government and like the immigration office is kind of looking at you at like okay so like this person came here they got their degree like we want to keep them here and like put their brains and work into the economy and into like our scientific organization or whatnot and um so in that it feels very friendly, it feels like it creates this very natural pathway from being a student to being on the graduate visa and then you cannot extend your graduate visa but it's kind of like natural to go from graduate visa into a work visa. It might be easy to think like okay so if I'm here for four years on my undergrad and then two years on my graduate visa that's six years in total which means that I can apply for citizenship. Unfortunately student visas this specifically the student visa part of things that does not count towards the five years you need to become a citizen uh, but the graduate visa does so that's nice. Um, obviously the biggest downside is that studying in the UK is pricey. It's like every year it gets pricier. Um, there's this whole idea that's like essentially the only thing that UK has to offer to the world is our higher education. Um, so yeah, like it's it's not cheap. And again, so I'm getting to the first point I made in like the little TLDR part of this video that money will help a lot because essentially if you do have money, if you have enough money to uh, pay for your course, if you have enough money to, you know, apply for the student visa and prove that you also have some savings to sustain yourself while studying, then I mean, why wouldn't you do that? Like you can you can become a student at any age. You can be a fun little geriatric student, you know, uh, hang out with the, the Zoomers. Uh, oh my god, like, don't let me become a geriatric student, that would be the worst! Um, also, I think what's quite generous is that on a student visa, you are allowed to work a little bit. You are allowed to work up to 20 hours a week, which is technically, it's like a part-time job. I mean, I don't think that you would want to work any more than that. So even before you get to like the graduate visa part of things, you're already like building a career. I mean, you're probably working in like the cinema or like Scott made, but <laughs> maybe not. Maybe you're working like as a part-time graphic designer at, I don't know, a legend agency or whatnot. So like you're already putting stuff onto your CV that like helps you grow roots here in the UK. And that's what you want, I'm assuming. 
Okay, so now we're getting on to the work visa, which I imagine a lot of you who have already been students once and maybe like you didn't have such a swell time and you don't like the idea of becoming students again. I respect that. So work visas, there's a lot of them and it's kind of hard to talk about them because there's so many different types. And not only that, as we speak, the government is actually changing the names of them. Uh, they have like changed the whole system like last month. So at the point where we started doing research for this video, things were like called different things. And when I was kind of double checking, I found out that they, they are like changing like right now. So I'm really hoping that the information I'm giving you right now is not gonna age like milk. So many of these new visas, which technically are just kind of repackaged old visas, are under the global mobility scheme. I guess that the government was getting tired of looking like they just don't want anyone here. So they tried to, you know, throw this into the mix. Um, a lot of these are short term, but I think that the most common um, long term one is the... Let me check. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna, not gonna lie to you. I need to, I, I just need to, I need to be transparent. That's like this, this information is not something that I have memorized. So I, I will have my computer here to like help my brain. Um, but yeah, essentially the one long-term visa you can get through the global mobility scheme is the senior and specialist worker visa and this is the sort of visa that you will most likely get if you're like working for a large corporation in the states or in europe or somewhere and they have some offices or some some presence in the uk and you can basically ask them like eh, look like i think that i would maybe be super helpful for you and like the the future of this company if you let me live and work in the UK and they can basically vouch for you and be your sponsor and um, make that happen for you. Um, I think that's the biggest detail like that makes this visa different than some of the other visas is that to be a successful applicant for this visa you have to be paid quite a lot of money. Like you have to be paid more than like 42k a year. And then you have the more regular long-term work visas. One of them is the health and care visa, which as you can imagine is for people who want to come here and work for the NHS. This is coincidentally the only visa where you don't have to pay the NHS surcharge. And for everyone else, there's the skilled worker visa. And I believe that in the past that was kind of limited to people who do jobs that are kind of um, like th th there's a shortage of them in the UK, but I think that recently that's not the case anymore. Um, essentially, there's this points system. You have to reach 70 points to be eligible for this visa. And there's a list of, I think about like eight or 10 things where you can collect these points, out of which three are mandatory. And the three are, you have to have a job offer from a licensed sponsor. Uh, you have to have a good, grasp of English language, uh, you will probably need to prove that through some sort of certification. See, like that's that's an expense you might need to also keep in mind. And also your job must be at a, an A-level skill level or above. So A-levels in UK or like I think specifically in England are the equivalent of the AP exams in the US. I would say essentially like if you're coming here and you're going to be doing something that would normally need a college or a uni diploma, then you're definitely in the clear. So for these three, you will collect, I believe, 50 points and then you have to collect another 20 somewhere. And you can collect those through either having a job that pays a lot or a job that is on a list of jobs that have a shortage. So here we're kind of coming back to that whole shortage theme. But um, yeah, your job doesn't have to be on the shortage list. You can also get points through having a PhD diploma and even more points if your PhD is in a, like a STEM subject, which is not fair. So especially for you, I looked into what are some of the jobs that we have shortage of here in the UK and it was kind of surprising to me. I think there was a lot of um, engineers, um, there was a lot of scientists and there was also a lot of artists and it really like I had a hard time understanding like how UK out of all places, like we're all so artsy, like here in, uh, you know, the, the capital of theater and fringe, like how do we not have enough artists? And then I realized it might simply be that artists 
rarely get paid. Therefore, <laughs> if you're an artist who is coming here with an offer of like a solid salary, then like you're like a unicorn. Like they do want you here. They do want artists that pay taxes. <laughs> then there's also quite a lot, like a whole handful of short term work visas, for example, like the seasonal traveling visas, you know, for people who come here to help on farms. And I think, um, you know, there's like specific kind of like, like charity work visas, things like that. And those usually last between six and 12 months. Um, for the regular long term visas, we're talking about more like the five year mark, at which point you can usually like refresh your visa again. Now, some visas which I do kind of see as like the lucky visas. First, the ancestral visa, which is basically made for people who live in the Commonwealth, uh, for whom um, essentially if your grandparent, which I, I would argue a lot of people who live in the Commonwealth countries do have at least one grandparent who had um, British citizenship. For those, it's relatively easy or okay. <laughs> for those, it's the obvious path to take. Um, it, it can be easier, like you still have to spend a lot of money and time on proving this like ancestral connection. It's not easy, but uh, I, I still think that if you do have this type of visa, you probably consider yourself lucky. Um, it is not a visa that's accessible to anyone else, really. But I did hear that some people, specifically in the US, have an easier time accessing uh, Canadian citizenship. So if you're in the US and you get your Canadian citizenship, then in theory, then that makes you eligible for the ancestral visa. So yeah, maybe, you know, that might be like a pro tip. Obviously, you know, if, if your immigration officer looks at you and like says like, oh, you did quite a lot of like <laughs> changes in your citizenship recently, that's a bit dodge. Uh, yeah, they might not like that. So I'm not sure if it works for everyone, but I did hear that some people do that. And I'm assuming some people do it successfully. And spousal visa, as you can imagine, a lot of people in my immediate social circle do have this specific type of visa just because, I mean, it's it's kind of the one where the immigration officers would probably have a hard time telling you like, no, sorry, like you married this person, but like you have to stay in Australia or Canada. You can't move in here to live with your legal spouse. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it doesn't actually have to be your spouse. It has to be a partner and you will have to prove that you were together for at least two years. You lived together. That's, that's a big part of it. So um, if this is something that you're trying to pursue, then keep in mind that you can't like live in two different cities or like even two different houses. You should be living together and you should be able to prove that you're paying bills together, rent, all of that, but you don't have to be actually like married. You don't have to have the same surname or any sort of paper that says that you're together because obviously a lot of people would be taking advantage of that and would just lead to like a sham marriage essentially. So let's talk about money. I keep coming back to that. I genuinely think money is very important in the whole process and it makes me a bit sad because a lot of you reach out to me and you ask me like if I have any tips and it's really through the process of making this video I have truly learned that um, you can buy moving to UK, <laughs> but you know, it's like going through any other way, whatever you do, whatever visa you go for, it's always going to be expensive. So yeah. Anywho. Um, so the expenses to expect, obviously you will have to pay for the application itself. So for example, on the youth mobility visa, it's pretty cheap. That's like 250, but it can go up to 1500 pounds per application. And also don't forget that you will probably wants to reapply later. So you will need to kind of, you know, revisit some of these expenses, which is kind of a bummer. Also, as mentioned many times before, you will need to have a savings account with like a healthy amount in it that has been sitting there for a while. Um, the amount again is, it changes depending on which visa you're going for. Um, don't forget to get 
your flights <laughs> obviously you will have to get here uh, which you know can be cheap it can be expensive depending where you're coming from um, there is a healthcare surcharge which um, again like I feel I I feel almost stupid that I have spent so much time telling you in all these videos how wow healthcare is so free like you don't have to pay for anything in Scotland when in fact uh, you will have to pay about 600 quid a year to access the free healthcare NHS and honestly the biggest bummer about that is that if you're here on one of these visas and you're paying your surcharge um, it's still yeah you're paying all this money and you still might not be able to access any of that free healthcare just because it's such a mess right now so uh, yeah you might actually end up also paying extra for private healthcare again this is the case of many of my friends um, and that makes me kind of sad but um, yeah uh, it might be a good motivation to go after that citizenship later <laughs> You will also need a whole bunch of money to kind of like find a place to live before you find your like proper address obviously depending maybe you're moving here you have a friend here or something like that but um, I think that for a lot of people who I watched their process of moving here they had to first stay at an Airbnb and you know staying in an Airbnb for a month or a couple of weeks can be quite pricey. I have also heard that if you are a pet owner and you're planning to move your here with you then uh, that might be even more expensive than moving yourself uh, <laughs> because obviously there are a lot of rules that you have to follow if you want to come with your pet you know depending on if your country is rabies free or isn't but even then you will need to be up to date on all your inoculations you will have to make sure your pet has a passport also some people told me that they actually paid for like a third party to deal with moving their pet they might have even mentioned that like the government asked them to do that um, but they did also mention that it gave them a bit of like a peace of mind because like having someone who specializes in that and who kind of like makes sure that your pet is okay and they keep sending you updates might actually be good when like you know you're already stressed with your own move it might be nice having someone else to deal with your pet but um, I don't know sounds it does sound stressful um yeah so what happens next if you don't hate it in the uk you might want to stay forever and for that it's quite practical to get a citizenship because obviously unless you know you managed to move here from the eu before brexit or like even like slightly before brexit and therefore you're on that pathway of getting your pre-settled status and then settled status which is like the most immigrant friendly pathway I think there is but I didn't mention it because at this point you can't really hop on that train anymore um, if you're coming on any of the other visas then usually what will happen is that you will be able to like ask for the citizenship after five years but to get the citizenship you first need to have one year of the indefinite leave to remain so there's this kind of like middle step and after that you can apply for your citizenship for the citizenship you have to like do a test you also have to make sure that you haven't like traveled too much like they're kind of keeping an eye on how many days you've spent outside of the uk this is by the way one of the reasons why i haven't been pursuing british citizenship because at the point where i became eligible for it I wanted to travel and you know like I have an international based job so like often before all the lockdowns and everything I would go somewhere for maybe like three weeks and then another month I would go somewhere for like two weeks and it really stacks up so like if they give you a limited amount of time that you can be outside of the UK if you want to pursue citizenship then having this to like think about and plan around can be really scary because like you never know what if you what if you're planning it very closely and then you get stuck in a country because like your flight got cancelled like imagine and that one thing then keeps you from applying for citizenship okay let's mention some things that might be standing between you and getting approved for a visa and some things that will definitely get you deported uh, so first up when you're applying you definitely want to make sure that all of your 
paperwork is correct like this is going to be very stressful there's going to be a lot of paperwork but as i mentioned you want to have a good relationship with all the immigration officers you don't want to make anyone unhappy with anything uh, you want everything to be very clear you want to disclose everything that's important like if you lie about any like problematic history they will probably find out and uh, they will not like it same goes for as previously mentioned if you have any like weird movement of money in your account that you need to show them to prove that you have savings then again like that's a bit a bit sus um you also don't want to look like your marriage is a sham marriage because like they obviously do look at that quite closely because a lot of people are trying to take advantage of the spousal visa so yeah just make everything look very legit uh keep track of everything, give them, you know, enough paperwork, enough detail and be very transparent. Now, after you did get your visa, just, you know, uh, the, <laughs> the surefire way of getting yourself kicked out is committing a crime. Don't commit crimes unless you like, I don't know. No. Nope. Just don't, yeah. <laughs> just that there shouldn't be any no unlesses. There's no unless. <laughs> just don't, don't, don't commit any crimes in the UK, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but also uh, be very cautious about like when your visa is ending because um, you do technically have like there's a like a tiny bit of wiggle room but from if if it takes you more than 20 days to leave the UK after your visa has ended you might not be allowed to go back to the UK for the next one to ten years which is quite a long time and um, I imagine I hope that after your visa is over, you don't completely hate the UK. Uh, but I mean, if you do, then fair, I guess. If you're coming closer to the end of your visa, make sure that you kind of know what your plan is. Maybe, you know, have some flights booked. And if someone asks, it's really, you know, it's good to be on the safer side and, you know, have something to tell them about your plans and about like you not intending to just like, stay here for those extra 30 days and then you know, not ever be allowed to come again. Okay, so I'm just gonna end this video with some tips, some like pro tips I got from people who actually have gone through the process. And again, as I mentioned, the process keeps changing, so maybe this will not be super relevant to you, but I still thought that some of these were very insightful and I wanted to make them a part of this video. So one thing that kept coming back was that you really need to have an address. So this is obviously very hard to have and it's good to have a friend or a family member or someone like that in the UK who will provide you with a bit like a bit of a temporary address because with that you might have an easier time starting a bank account which is another big part of like starting your life in the UK. Another tip was that when you're providing any documentation to the immigration officers make sure that it's very organized and like as thorough but understandable as possible. Also, at the point when you decide that you want to move, uh, e even if you decide that you're moving in the next two or three years, start collecting all the evidence you need. Uh, this might be, you know, evidence of, you know, any, any bills, any like health checks, all of this, like, Collect it now because it's going to be much harder to backtrack later if, you know, you're filling in your paperwork in two years. It's good to just kind of like keep it around as you go and then have it ready and just, you know, spend time organizing it instead of trying to hunt it down into history. Also, if you have it available to you, apply for a priority visa because then apparently the immigration officers actually do have some responsibility to like stick to a certain timeline. Uh, if you don't have a priority visa application, then um, it might happen at whatever time. They, they don't care. And last thing is, if you think you would rather be like a digital nomad and you know you would like to take advantage of the things like you know the standard visitor visa and kind of like hop between countries but also work from them um this might actually make the application process a bit more complicated later in your life like 
if you want to be in digital nomad now, but then later on you want to apply for one of the regular visas, then the officers will probably look into that. Like they will see weird patterns in your travel history and that might be a red flag for them. Um, so if you're digitally nomading, try to keep it as vanilla as possible or just, you know, just get married to that lifestyle and uh, give up the dream of living here forever. All right, so that is all the points that I wanted to convey to you today in this video. Um, again, this was kind of skimming the surface. I know it's it would be extremely hard and it would make an extremely long video if I wanted to cover everything for everyone. Um, but I do think that some of the points I made based on the research we've done could genuinely be interesting or helpful to some of you. Um, absolutely do let me know down in the comment section below if anything was helpful to you or if there's any questions you have. It might simply be that uh, we do know, but we just didn't have the time to make it a part of this video. Um, yeah, uh, and of course, if you have recently moved and you think something is not quite sounding right, or if you've recently moved and you have a different pro tip that you'd like to share with other people who are pursuing the the visa path, then absolutely share it down in the comment section because I like to see like a lively community kind of sharing tips and having a conversation, debating, discourse. In the meantime, before you get your dream visa, please visit me on social media on either KakiBot or KakiBlog on Instagram or also on TikTok under KakiBot. Or you can also visit my Etsy store, which is also the KakiBot store. I'm gonna link it in the doobly-doo together with many, many links to hopefully practical articles and other resources for all of you who are trying to live your UK moving dream. Alrighty, so that is it from me. Um, I'm so happy that this video is now behind me because this has taken us so much time to make and research. And again, I'm so hopeful that this helps someone because otherwise so much time wasted. <laughs> okay, good luck and I shall see you soon. Bye.